Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Farley, and I'm, I am one of a JRSA's research associates. And for those of you who are less familiar with JRSA, it stands for the Justice Research and Statistics Association. And we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to the use of research and analysis to inform criminal and juvenile justice decision making. And we are comprised of a network of researchers and practitioners, which at the core include directors and staff from state statistical analysis centers. And before we go any further, I just want to thank our, our partners at the Bureau of Justice Statistics for helping us make this, um, make this webinar possible. And it is my pleasure today to welcome you to our webinar on integration of social network analysis and spatial analysis. It is going to be presented by George Kikuchi, Matt Latanzio, and Kevin Thomas. And together they conduct research and analysis for the Philadelphia Police Department. And just as a side note, I, I had learned about them and their interesting work through their presentation at last year's American Society of Criminology Conference. Um, and so I wanted to welcome them and thank them for making the time to present to our audience today. So with that, if we don't have any issues, I'm going to pass it to George, Matt, and Kevin. Welcome. Good afternoon, guys. So this is George, and I have Matt and Kevin with me in the room. If you have a difficulty hearing us, feel free to note it in the text. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. There will be three parts to our presentation. First, starting with Kevin's giving an overview of how PPD's analytics are structured. Then we will move on to specific uh, research questions and research uh, topics revolving around how we have been integrating link analysis, social network analysis within the context of uh, spatial analysis. And that will be done by George, myself, and Matt as two separate uh, sub-presentations. So, Aaron, are you seeing the screen? Okay, I'm just, I just want to make sure yeah. that we're good to go. I am, and if anybody is seeing, because it, it is a little big on mine, so I don't know if any of the audience is seeing it, what you can do is you can look down in the left-hand corner, and, you know, for some reason mine's at 116%, and you can just minimize it, and so you can see the whole screen if anybody else um, is experiencing that. But it looks great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, thanks, George, and uh, thanks, Aaron, for having us speak. Um, happy to do it and happy to learn from you guys as well. So looking forward to working with you guys more in the future. My name is Kevin Thomas. I'm the director for the research and analysis unit at the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, I'm probably the least important and least exciting of, of all these slides. So um, I'll try to get through my part fairly quickly so that you can get to the good stuff. But uh, uh, George was thinking that it might be good to sort of see sort of how we came to be and, um, and uh, where the, uh, and uh, what the process has been for us, because it's, what we're finding is it's been a little bit different. Every police department has its own character and its sort of own uh, evolutionary process. Uh, we had ours, so um, hopefully there's, there's something in here that's interesting. Um, at that point, we'll go into the analysis of shooting by combining, uh, and, and analyzing shootings through social network analysis and spatial analysis and then analyzing social and geographic gang connections. Um, so just a quick overview. Um, Philadelphia, uh, uh, we're, we're currently we are the research and analysis unit as part of the overall intelligence bureau, but that's not necessarily how we started. Um, originally, um, um, uh, about five or six years ago, there was uh, really the only thing in terms of analysis at uh, the Philadelphia Police Department were some GIS folks that did a lot of crime mapping and hotspot mapping and things of that nature. And uh, there was a, there's been some real recent pushes here to increase the analytical capacity. Uh, originally, um, we were uh, primarily uh, a small unit that was put together under Commissioner Charles Ramsey uh, back in 2013. And that was to, basically the way I, I joke about it is they put all the nerds in one big group. So they took, uh, they took the GIS people, they took the UCR reporting people, the statistics section, and, uh, and then we had one analyst at the time. 
and they put that all under one research and analysis unit, uh, and I re directly reported to uh, the deputy commissioner. Uh, over that time, we grew, and uh, but really where it all started was with the data. So um, prior to this unit forming, there was a big evolution going on, and I apologize for the slide. I know it looks like it's like from 1995, um, and some things have changed about it, but I thought we would at least use it. Um, this was our focus to begin with. And this started out of the GIS group that had been working on aggregating data and trying to create a platform or a central hub for data to be shared with analysts, real-time applications, dashboards. I'm sure you've seen this type of slide many times from GIS people. But uh, we understood that, that really it all has to start with the data. You can, you can get all the analysts and cool apps and stuff that you want, but at the end of the day, it has to connect to data and information, and that data has to be made available and standardized in such a manner that you have consistency across that. And that was a big issue at the police department with a lot of our aging systems. So there was a lot of work done between about 2008 and 2012 to take the legacy GIS system, upgrade that, upgrade that into a true uh, fully tiered system, staging, production, and development environments uh, that was far more robust. Um, at that point, when I came on board in 2013, a lot of that work had been completed and uh, we put this research and analysis unit together. At that time, Deputy Commissioner Nola Joyce under Charles Ramsey uh, was really interested in focusing on evidence-based policing practices. And in fact, there was a few things that were already going on internally to the department. So um, this is just a smattering of them. I'm not going to read them all off, but um, some, of the, some of the bigger ones that you may have heard of are things like the Philadelphia Foot Patrol experiment uh, that was done at Temple University and Jerry Ratcliffe, the policing tactics experiment, uh, which sort of analyzed foot patrol and problem-oriented policing and uh, offender-focused approaches. Uh, there was uh, hypothesis testing, which was really focused on problem solving, and uh, th that's a recent one that we had recently finished up. And um, we, but we've also done full randomized control trials for, with things like Hunch Lab, which is a, a predictive policing software, uh, as well as testing um, randomized control trials, looking at acoustic gunshot sensors and focused deterrence and and, and body cameras and. And, and um, uh, I joke that these things take time, but uh, unfortunately, that's, that's really the truth. Uh, a lot of times, these academic efforts take years and years to, come, uh, to, to happen, and, and mayors change, and commissioners change. And so uh, we were really working on building analytical capacity internally so that we could sort of maybe not do the gold standard of research, but perhaps do research uh, that maybe meets the bronze or silver standard that's good enough to be able to help our decision makers identify what, what works and what doesn't. And that quote up there really was, was, came from our uh, crime, uh, Ramsey's crime fighting strategy, which I think is really the genesis of our group, is that we must understand what works, how it works, when it works, and where it works. The answer to these questions provide the foundation for evidence-based policing strategies. And since that time, Ramsey has left, and now we're under Commissioner Ross, but that's still very much a part of the ethic of our team which has sort of expanded um, since they left in 2015. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of some of those uh, smart policing grants uh, was, um, was to uh, grow our analytical capacity. That was something that we learned from our policing tactics experiment when we tried to do problem solving, was that we did not have enough analysts to be able to do this. So we began training police officers. Um, there, uh, we have 21 districts, um, so several of our busy districts got a, a handful, but over about two to three years uh, through uh, uh, folks like uh, Jerry, Radcliffe, and, and uh, George, we were able to train upwards of 26 officers and 10 detectives using GIS uh, and um, uh, ArcGIS and other sort of analytical techniques. Um, and uh, we, were, we decentralized them, so they still worked for their various captains within their districts. Uh, we acted as like a central group that ended up providing the training and providing sort of a help desk for them. I'm going to keep on, I'm going to try to move faster so I don't take up the time. Um, but since that time, as of last year, uh, we had really uh, expanded quite a bit. And uh, at that point, under Commissioner Ross, he decided that he wanted to combine all this into one intelligence bureau. There were a smattering of analysts in other groups, particularly intel analysts, over with like the uh, criminal uh, intelligence unit. But he took all those various analysts and he combined them under one chain of command within an intelligence bureau. And that, was, uh, uh, that, that really was a big uh, 
a big culture change for us. It made us a lot more operational than we were before. And on top of that, more interesting to thinking about data, it gave us access to a lot of data that we did not have access to before, basically the, the human data or the human source reporting data, you know, the type of data that is more typically quali qualitative, that is, you know, George and, and, and uh, Matt and, and Kevin like to hang out on this drug corner or something like that. That would be a, an example of human source information, something that we didn't necessarily have access to before. Uh, one of the things that we learned, it becoming more operational, is that we needed to, to be able to continue that evidence-based practice in the research. We really needed to create a dedicated team, and that's what George and uh, Matt are, are two members of, that George runs, and that is the strategy research and evaluation section. Uh, that way they, they can stay focused on doing this type of work, which otherwise, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day shootings and the things that occur and the crime problems and crime patterns would end up sort of taking most of the wind out of the sails. So that was something that we learned early on. A couple of the other things we learned early on were the difference between these intelligence analysts and, 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 and more crime analysts, that they're very different backgrounds. We have some people that can do both, but not it's, it's very rare. But one thing about the intelligence data that we did learn, which I think really feeds in to um, um, what you're going to be ta we're, we're going to be talking about with social network analysis, is that that human source information is just another data set, and that's the way that we're trying to think about that information, both in terms of trying to take unstructured text or narrative information and structure that better so that those connections between people by intelligence can be visualized through social and, and utilized for social network analysis and because those types of those types of human source reporting if it's good information is far more of a direct connection between two individuals than just the fact that they were co-defendants three years ago or that they happened to be stopped together in the car you, you get to understand a little bit more about what the criminal dynamic is because you might understand also what roles that they play within that group. And that's a, extremely important when doing sort of social network analysis. Um, so both terms in terms of trying to structure that data appropriately and or use analytics, text analytics, to be able to structure that data automatically is something that we've been working on. So um, that gives you a little bit of the history of where we are and where we stand. Um, and um, I will now pass it to George to talk a little bit about the analysis. Thanks, Kevin. So, uh, as Kevin mentioned, I run a small section on strategy and research, and one of the things that my section does is to develop a prototype application, which includes uh, one of our flagship application and connecting individuals based upon the data that uh, uh, our unit consolidates and essentially holds. And here's a screen capture of uh, our web-based link analysis application. And the way it works is if you type in a person's name, let's say Kevin Thomas, it searches through our arrest record and try to identify who have been uh, arrested together. So in this case, uh, search the individual will be highlighted in yellow. I know it's, it may be somewhat difficult to see on this screen capture, but in the center is a yellow highlighted individual. And you have a bunch of dots surrounding him indicating that all other people have been arrested together in the past. And by default, it, the application searches through two degrees of separation, meaning if I have been arrested together with a Kevin, and if Kevin has been arrested together with a Matt, and from me to Kevin is one degree of separation, and from Kevin to Matt, uh, from me centrally is a second degree of separation. And by default, the application looks for uh, two degrees of separation. But application also allows, uh, allows a user to change the parameters and so forth. A few other things that the application does uh, is highlights those individuals with active orange. So all those individuals highlighted in red square in this screen are those individuals that currently have active warrants. And we developed this application about two, uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, we showed this to our bosses and they got excited. And our bosses always get excited with a new toy. <laughs> but immediately some of the feedback that we got was that they wanted to take it to the next level. Uh, as soon as we give them a new toy, they want more. And in this context specifically, A, uh, they wanted to search multiple individuals all at once. So rather than typing a 
Kevin Thomas's name and Matt's name separately, they wanted to type in like a multiple individuals. And that was relatively easy to accomplish. Then they got crazier, and they wanted to see how all those shooting victims in Philadelphia are connected. And we have a lot of, unfortunately, we have a lot of shooting victims. Each year, we have approximately 1,500 to 1,600 shooting victims. And they wanted to see how those shooting, shooting victims may be connected. And that's doable. But they also wanted to do something else. And they wanted to see link analysis uh, results on the map. And we were able to accomplish, uh, well, respond to that request. And this, I'm framing this as a boss getting a new toy, and they got excited, and they gave, they wanted more uh, in a joking way. But my background, Kevin's background, and Matt's background is a GIS, and hence visualizing it on the map personally excited me, and I was interested in uh, looking at how the shooting victim pattern on link analysis looks like in Philadelphia. And this is what uh, we came up with. So what you are seeing on the screen is our uh, web-based mapping application, and this is being used for CompStat and other purposes. But specifically in this screen, I'm showing uh, shooting victims in the past 60 days and color coding them based upon whether or not they belong to the same network. Any grade dots, which are symbolized in small uh, circle, each of those is a shooting victim in the past 60 days. But they didn't have any other shooting victims within their known associates. While those individuals with the same color belonged to the same network or they had common known associates. And here's an example of how uh, this application works. If you click a dot, or shooting instant, there's a pop-up showing some context of the shooting, including uh, date of occurrence, a victim's name, and so forth. But this pop-up is hyperlinked to a link analysis application that shows how those shooting victims may be connected to each other. So in this case, uh, or in this example, I clicked a, a green circle that also has uh, another shooting victim within their network, and hence uh, we have two individuals highlighted in yellow. And what that is showing is that in the past they have been arrested together. <laughs> Can't get to. Uh, slide 17, but what I wanted to oh, type in, yeah, 17, here we go, yeah, and immediately what we started seeing based upon this uh, spatial visualization of link analysis is that connections exist across divisional boundaries. So as Kevin mentioned, Philadelphia a Police Department is broken down into 21 districts. And those 21 districts are grouped into six divisions. And I'm just showing on the screen divisional boundary with a blue line. And I'm highlighting two light blue dots indicating that two separate shooting victim in the past 60 days. They've been shot on a separate day, on a separate location, but they have a common known associate, and they belong to the same network. But it just so happens that detective bureaus in Philadelphia Police Department are organized by division. So 
And I have no law enforcement background. My background is in research, and the only thing I have been learning is from law and order. But my impression of detectives are that they don't talk to each other. They do not want to share information, right? And if shootings are happening across divisions, they may not even be looking at these two separate things. But our analysis can easily show that there's something common going on between those two separate instances. And I got curious more and more about how these cross-division shootings uh, have some commonalities. And hence, uh, here's my research question and some hypothesis to drive my analysis. Besides social connection, meaning uh, previous poor offending, are there anything else that are common or that looks similar and that may be connecting these shooting victims? Specifically, my interest would be those in instances that occur across divisions. But my guess or my gut instinct was that connected instances may be more similar than some random instance. So they may have a similar background, they may have been killed with the similar weapons, and instances may have occurred on a similar day of the week, similar time, and so forth. Maybe because victims have similar lifestyles and they have some commonalities or common backgrounds in the beginning. And my approach, uh, I have two approaches, and one that I'm going to focus on is a bunch of crosstalks to see what patterns that, that I can dissect. But in future, I will also be looking at uh, simulation models to see if we can, uh, if I can assess statistical significance of those similarities and so forth. And my unit of analysis grouped the shootings, and the time period for the purpose of this research was uh, between 2005 and 2016, which, uh, which included about 18,000 shooting victims, or approximately 1,600 victims per year. Out of those uh, 18,000 shooting victims, approximately 5% of the victims uh, belonged to the same network, or this equated to 900 victims that have some connection to another victim. And one of the first things that I wanted to look at, as I mentioned, was how often those common network shooting victims cross jurisdictional or divisional boundaries. And it turned out the pretty significant proportion of uh, shooting victims or network cross divisional boundaries, more specifically 40% of uh, network cross divisional boundaries. Looking at some background of the shooting victims, 90% uh, of connected incidents involved single race, and more specifically 82% were African American and approximately 8% were Caucasian and so forth. And African-American victims are more likely to be connected than uh, Caucasian victims. And I will, I will just be going through quickly some of the characteristics that uh, I examined separately, but in the end, I will be summarizing some of the punchlines and how this analysis may or may not be useful for both research and investigation. Looking at sex, the vast majority of our shooting victims are male to begin with, but connected shootings are more likely to be male uh, far more likely to be uh, males than females. Looking at the criminal circumstance of the shooting, 10% of the connected incidents were part of robberies, and to me that looked pretty low compared to uh, how often robberies may lead to uh, shooting incidents. And in fact, comparing connected shootings to non-connected shootings, probably actually were less likely to be connected than uh, non-connected shooting incidents. Looking at the victim's past, victims are far more likely to have gun crimes and also narcotics prior arrest. Looking at the gangs, 
gang approximately 40% of the connected incident involved or occurred within the gang boundaries. And what was interesting to me was that in many cases, we actually are making um, arrests. So let's say hypothetically, there are two victims belonging to a single network. Chances are in 50% of the cases, we have made an arrest on that case. We may not have solved two cases, but data-wise, the likelihood is that we have arrested one of the shooting victims in that case. So summarizing some of the uh, findings that I saw, approximately 5% of the shooting victims have uh, social connections, and 40% of shooting victims or connected shooting incidents cross divisional boundaries, indicating that detectives definitely need to talk to each other. But more importantly, implications of this analysis is that we may actually be able to find out what is going on about the victim and their, their network, if not already. First of all, 70% of shooting victims in general have uh, prior arrests, and slightly higher percentages of connected shooting victims have gun crimes and or narcotics prior. So we already we should already be uh, knowing a, li a little bit about those shooting victims. And what was more startling to me was that in half of the connected shooting victim network, at least one arrest has been made. So they've already solved one of the cases, and why not go after the other cases by looking at the connections and soliciting information perhaps from the arrested offender. And what we also saw, uh, I didn't run any statistics, but cursory visual inspection indicated that active warrants are pretty common around shooting victims network. And perhaps investigators may be able to utilize the presence of active warrants as a leverage to solicit information. And the direction that I want to go in future is that I was interested in developing automatic notification system so that especially when shooting victims exist across divisions, but those shooting victims belong to the same network. I could easily create a notification system so that detectives get that information automatically. But, and I had that idea, but I sort of paused because uh, sometimes detectives may not really be interested in uh, getting information on other cases, especially if they think that that would lead to more work for them. And there could be some cultural challenges among detectives, and they may simply may not want to change their current workflow. And I worked with both investigative uh, analysts and detectives, and I could easily tell that they want an ability to be able to search information, but sometimes they may not be so receptive or they may not fully understand what analytical applications do. And that's where I sort of paused on, on this project. But again, uh, to summarize some of my key findings, they have already solved one of the cases. So <laughs> I feel like that's convincing of them to take this to the next level. and and detectives take advantage of this. And with that, uh, I will pass on to Matt, who also have been looking at social network analysis within the context of GIS. Thanks, George. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Latanzio. I work for the Philadelphia Police Department as an analyst under George Kikuchi. And the research focus for this project is the relationship between geography and gangs, and specifically the changes in local crime around those gangs. The police department, especially the larger departments, but something that we're very good at is generating paperwork and collecting, <laughs> and collecting basic data on incidents and 
they get filed away, and normally nothing, nothing happens to it. It's very reactive. Now, what you're looking at is an example of how the, the data is basically structured in a very simple format of taking the information that we already natu naturally col collect in the policing field and then put into a structured, uh, put into a structured format. And commonly, this would be known as an edge list, and it should simply put it's just a list of connections. In this case, sorted by type, which would be arrest, uh, stop, and victimization. And we keep this on a personal level so that, let's say, one gang member would be arrested with another. And we have that data stored on a server, and we can easily ac access that. And when you take those relationships where two people are stopped together in, a, in the same car, or two people are arrested together, or one person victimizes another, we structure that out, and then we bring it up one level. So instead of saying Kevin victimized George, we say that Kevin's gang victimized George's gang. So we take this personal one-to-one uh, -one person relationship and bring it up to an organizational level. And we, take, we can take that data and using the pivot table function, in, in, in this case Excel, we can summarize the relationships between groups. And what you're looking at here is the number of relationships between groups uh, color-coded. In this case, green being uh, a low amount of relationships, red being the highest. And this data structure is perfect for the software that we use called Aura where you can take this data and then map it out later on in terms of a link, uh, social network chart. Now, by positive connection, we mean those connections that are friendly in nature. If two people are stopped together in the same car or they're stopped on the street or they're arrested together, in this case, they're not, they're not killing each other, so we're counting that as a good thing. Conversely, if, there, if one is victimizing another, we're considering that a negative connection. Now, in mo many cases in Philadelphia, that means a shooting. It may, it may also mean a burglary, a robbery, but in most incidents, one gang member shot another gang member. And similar to the other pivot table, you're looking at a color-coded chart where the red indicates many victimizations between those two groups. That pivot table, uh, both positive and negative, then gets charted out and examined using social network uh, software. And the chart you're looking at is every gang in Philadelphia as they are connected to every other gang in Philadelphia. The size of the squares is a measure called the betweenness. And as simply as I can explain it, it's how that group sits on the network between the other groups. The idea being that a group with a high betweenness is, at least in the explanation, easiest to pass information through if you wanted to pass information from one end of the network to the other. Now, what that doesn't take into account is the more qualitative relationship between gang members or how often they communicate. What we're doing is taking our reports, our police reports, and aggregating the data, mapping out the connections and looking at the potential for information sharing, the potential for who in that network, in this case, the organizational network, which organizations may, mo may be most important to the overall gang structure in, in the city of Philadelphia. This chart shows the negative connections. Remember, this is victimization, and it's directional. So it may, it may be hard to see in, this, in these examples, but there are actually small arrows indicating from which gang victimized another gang. So the arrow pointing to the group the, on the receiving end would be the victim. And you may notice that Gang 30 has many arrows pointing into its symbol, meaning it's, it's being victimized by multiple other gangs. And this becomes uh, more of a concern that where you have one gang who being victimized by multiple groups 
And then you have these other groups that, as far as we can tell, don't actually know each other, but they share a common enemy, and that's when it becomes dangerous, where you have a, a large gang conflict that otherwise, had we not mapped out these relationships, we would not have known that it's structured in, in this manner. So now the focus becomes, in these gang conflicts, how far across the city do they extend? Because a, a gang with a high organization where they have the resources and the wherewithal to maintain large connections to other groups across vast distances, to us that indicates a level of sophistication. And that's something that makes them da more dangerous than, say, a group of friends that just so happen to commit a crime every now and then. Now this leads to a couple gaps investigationally where does an, does an area experience more crime if the gangs in the area are friendly towards each, other, towards each other? The idea being, if my gang is not focused on fighting some other gang, does, it, does the focus then turn to members of the public? How many gang-on-gang -gang conflicts are personal business where it's truly between two people who happen to be in a gang and not related to the business of running that gang, the finances, the narcotics, and things like that. And finally, the, the structure of the gang, how does that affect the local crime? In that some gangs we have across the city, like I said, are just friends who happen to identify as under uh, a common banner, so to say, and they, they commit crimes together, or they have much more sophisticated gangs that are run almost like a business and an organization. So would those gangs have a different, that are structured differently, would their conflicts be more on a professional level between the other gangs, or does that not matter to the cause of the conflict? So what we've done is we've taken these charts and we've developed an, a, an online application because currently in beta where you can pick a gang, any gang in the city from a drop down and then have the other gang territories across the city color code to show the relationship. So not only the relationship in a positive and negative way, but also the geography between gang boundaries. Now this, this example was done in ArcGIS Arc, uh, Desktop because the gang app has a lot of personal identifiable information, but we still wanted to show you the concept. And what you're seeing in blue would be the selected gang. The green boxes would be the territories that are friend on good terms, on positive terms with the, the gang in blue. And the red territories are those gangs that have a negative relationship with the gang in blue. And this, and while the, the, the names and locations are randomized, this, can, these connections are real connections between uh, these gangs. And what we're seeing in this case is that you have the blue gang and, his, and essentially uh, three potential partners the blue gang is having a conflict with these, uh, the gangs in red, and you'll notice that one of the gangs in red has, hold, has enough resources to hold two different territories, and that also makes them dangerous. Because if they have an increased resource, then that makes them more effective in combating the, the gang they're in conflict with. Similarly, we have the, a small gang in blue, and then we ha who are on good terms with gangs in green and on, on bad terms in gangs in red. Now these other gangs that they're related to have enough resources to hold a much greater area of territory. And this is where the geography comes into play where these gangs, not only in this case, it crosses different districts, but that, that's actually a divisional cross right down the center of the map. And this one small gang is fighting a much larger gang, but they also have partners that are e almost as equally as big in, in terms of territory held to the, the, red, the gang in red. Now, we have, like I mentioned, we have this in an app form that was made with Esri Web App Builder. And with very little programming experience, this is completely within reach to smaller departments. 
and we there was a challenge in incorporating the an auditing and security aspect to it, but we've met that, and we can set the the requirements and the uh, the accessibility as needed. We're in, we're working on integrating it with other online content, and where we hope to go is a standard standardization of gang names, which. In, the, in our case, is almost cultural because certain gangs were formed almost, you know, some, there's one gang in the city that goes back decades, and they may reinvent themselves, but they're known to people in the department under one name, and, but they've reinvented under another name. So over time, they come up, they come, the same group may have multiple names, so we have to come up with a way to standardize, at least for the, uh, for the digital form of it, one gang name. Daily updates, as, because as of now, the app is static. And most importantly, and as Kevin mentioned earlier, we want to incorporate, incorporate the human intelligence side of this. Because as of now, all these connections are coming out of police reports. Now, the good part about police reports is that for a fact, these two people were spotted together in some fashion. If they were stopped together, it's because an officer made contact had a reason to investigate and recorded on that day and time that they were stopped together for this for some reason. The same thing with an arrest. It's recorded that for sure they can, they, that they were arrested for this crime and that that's recorded in, in our records. But we, what we don't know as far as the data recorded is more the more institutionalized knowledge of uh, our intel unit and that we start to look at other connections, such as family connections, who are brothers, who are cousins, any romantic connections, shared addresses, connections similar in, to that nature where it goes beyond traditional police reporting. And once we have those connections, we can then start to build out a much more comprehensive and massive network of who knows who and how, and how they know each other. And then once we have that network, we can start to run metrics on who is most important to that network, who would be the quickest to pass information to, who may not have a lot of connections but knows somebody who does have a lot of connections. And there's a lot of different investigative ways we could, we could go with this information. And that's the biggest direction that we could go with this and one of the most important. And with that, I'd like to pass it back to George Kikuchi. So uh, here's our contact information in case you guys want more detailed information, especially with law enforcement agency, we're more than happy to do a demo of actual applications and so forth. But for the purpose of this public presentation, we needed to anonymize this content for obvious reasons. With that, uh, I'll pass it back to Aaron, and we're here to answer any questions that you guys may have. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, just type it up in the chat box at the bottom right hand corner. Um, in the meantime, well first, I'm, now that I'm not on mute, there's a thunderstorm happening right now, so if you hear any weird noises, it's just the thunder. Um, but um, I was curious, um, sort of just as a side question, when you look at the maps and you see the territories, and some of them are um, weird shapes and things of that sort. How do you gather that in information? I'm assuming part of that is human intelligence, but um, is that in terms of like really standardizing or, well, verifying the boundaries? How, um, what sort of process um, do you go through to, to do that? So the gang territories, yeah. as shown, are based on human intelligence of where that gang, the core of that gang operates. Now, this, obviously, the, as, as people, they, they, people have free will, and they can just move in and out of the box as they please. They're not relegated to staying in that one box. Mm -hmm. But the, that representation right. is meant to be a, the core of where mm -hmm. that gang is, is found. Is in, in Philadelphia, we, m many of our gangs are neighborhood-based, and that territory represents the neighborhood that that gang represents. Mm -hmm. Where the the gang will many gangs will actually call themselves after a certain neighborhood, or if they're from a certain uh, apartment building, or eat, you know, or they're, if they're from a, a certain school, even so, mm -hmm. that the, it's really the core of where those members can be found. Okay, 
Uh, okay. To follow up on that, we are actually undertaking a research project to objectively define where their area of influence is by mm -hmm. plotting where these gang members have been arrested, where they have been stopped, and so forth. So then we can cross-reference what human intel is saying, where their area of influence or where mm -hmm. area of operation is, as opposed to where exactly they are committing crimes. And mm -hmm. I think we have just completed uh, defining those objective areas are, and we have like a bunch of research questions to pursue based upon that data. And off the top of my head, some of the things that we'll be interested in is how area of operation changes based upon the uh, gang size, mm -hmm. or perhaps type of, or primarily type of criminal activities that they engage in. If they are strictly focusing on narcotics, their area may be pretty small, and when they commit violent crimes, they may go beyond their typical area of operation and so forth. And there will be like a, so many analysis that we're interested in uh, pursuing mm -hmm. with this. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, one is, do your prosecute? Okay, hold on. Let me go up a little bit more. I think I. Um, I don't know if people, okay, I can hear that thunder. Hopefully my power doesn't go out, so forgive me if I disappear, it's not intentional. Okay, so here we go, first question. Have you considered using NIBIN um, leads for the social network? I think you'd find higher rates of connection between incidents. I don't know if it's initials or if it's called NIBIN. Yeah, this is, hello, this is Kevin. It's, uh, yeah, Nibin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we do receive, we don't receive the, the Nibin information uh, directly from the ATF in sort of a structured form right now. We, can, we are receiving individual reports. When we receive those individual Nibin reports, um, they go through a process of being vetted about whether or not uh, we have the, um, uh, the resources to do a more robust analytical analysis of that Nibin job. Um, uh, that gives you an idea of how many we receive. It's, it's quite a few. Um, we're, we're working right now with the ATF to find a way to be able to get this data in a more structured form because this is something that we talk about very frequently. And yes, that's, this is definitely a direction that we want to go. Um, but uh, as of this point, uh, we, we are not receiving that information in a form where we can do that easily. So uh, the magnitude of Nibon Lee's or the frequency of Nibon leads that get generated in Philadelphia, uh, something like multiple reports per day? Yeah, so, I mean, we're producing at least, so just for the gang-related ones, which is maybe 30% of the total, we're doing um, maybe six or so per week. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so if you, I guess if we multiplied that out, mm -hmm. that, that gets to be a fairly decent number if you include even the non-gang-related uh, Nibon leads. And the Nibon leads come in as like a PDF document, and hence we're looking for like a structured spreadsheet type of thing. Or like a, yeah. Yeah, but on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, we are adding those Nibon-based connections to our in-depth social network analysis so that if individuals shared a gun in the past, then that may be a connection that we may be building and adding on a case-by-case -case basis. But yes. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, do your prosecutors find this useful? Can they use these analysis during prosecution? Yeah, I, uh, this is Kevin again. Um, I, we, we've gone through quite a few changes here at, in the city of Philadelphia in terms of a new DEA, a new mayor. Uh, a lot of the, the new DEA, I think, right now has, has come to sit with us and see what we're able to provide. We've had some very promising conversations with him so far. Um, uh, there's a whole new rash of just, uh, assistant district attorneys now here in the city. Um, so again, I think um, there have been a few uh, individual cases that we've worked on specifically where we've used some of these techniques, and that, um, but they just haven't reached a, a point where uh, they would have to be used in court yet. <laughs> 
So again, a lot of the stuff that you're seeing right now is stuff that is only about only about a year old, probably less than a year old. Um, when uh, I think it's really amazing what can happen when we take this intersection of technologists or GIS people or people who can create apps, um, overlap them with researchers like these guys that I'm sitting in here looking at data in a different way, and then our intelligence side. Uh, that, that's a that's a that's a new area for us right now. So I think uh, I think at, at, and city is pretty big. We got about seven uh, six thousand five hundred officers or something like that in a fairly decent sized DA's office. So we're getting there. Um, I, I think I'll have a better answer to that question probably in the next in probably the next year. Great, thank you. We have um, looks like one more question before I uh, read that. I just want to let people know we do have a poll. We're about to. Um, open up and so while we're um, talking, um, please take a moment to answer the few questions that will help us out. And so the next question is, um, is the web map app um, accessible to road deputies and how do they access it, if so? Yeah, so um, we've um, deliberately designed our, uh, our uh, data environment so that it's, it's accessible to anyone that is sitting on uh, the, the network, um, uh, of course, vetting them for, by their, uh, who, they're, who they are presenting, who they're logged in as. Um, so we do have access control uh, at the user level, and, but it's been designed so that even our mobile data computers, or MDCs as we call them, which is basically like a Panasonic Toughbook, you've seen those, that's what's actually in the cars. Um, yes, they can access any of these applications straight from the road. Um, I'd love to actually look at some of the logs uh, and, and see how often that's actually done. So you gave me an idea uh, to give to the, to the app development team. But um, uh, I would say more often than not, this is used internally on, on, on desktop computers. But yes, short answer is yes, I, it is available to them. Hey. Great. Um, I think that was the last question. I did have one. So I came across the work that you guys do at the uh, through ASC, and I was wondering, are you guys, um, any of you planning to attend uh, the upcoming ASC conference? And I think it's in Atlanta this year. Uh, maybe, but uh, I think we will also be interested in ACJS. That would be closer to us. Like, I think the mm -hmm. next one is Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right, yes, in Baltimore. Okay, so people can find you there, awesome. Um, well, um, I think that we have um, reached the end of our webinar, and um, if anybody has any follow-up questions, obviously the contact information is, is there. And um, I would like to thank you all, the presenters, for taking the time out to speak to us and present to the audience. Um, we do have, before I forget, we do have another webinar that is tentatively scheduled for August. So we're just working out and finalizing the day. And so keep, um, keep your eyes open for that announcement. It should be coming soon. And uh, thank you again for joining us. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. See you then.